grab your Bibles. Um, we're going to, in just a few minutes, be looking at Matthew chapter uh, 1. So in your Red Pew Bibles, page 955. So just get that open, get that ready, and we'll be there in just a couple minutes. Friends, I think we undersell Jesus Christ. Can I say that again? I think we undersell Jesus, who he is and what he's capable of. Now, I've been contemplating an awful lot lately about my eternal salvation in heaven. I have had four of my closest friends pass away in the last 10 weeks, so it's been a pretty heavy uh, few weeks. And I don't say that to gain your sympathy, but thank you for those that have been praying for, uh, for Sherry and I. But uh, yesterday, we had a, just a, a glorious um, worship service and celebration for the best friend I've ever had in my life, a man of God who uh, literally hundreds of people would say uh, he was one of their closest friends. He was just a, larger than life and full of God's Holy Spirit. I learned more about my faith from, from my brother John Norsworthy uh, than anybody I've ever learned from. And, and yesterday we put him to rest. I was privileged to be a part of that. So I, I've been contemplating, I've been contemplating this eternal salvation, this joy of knowing that my brother John's eternity is set and I'm gonna hang out with him. In fact, I've been praying that God would just bring a little folding chair up to the edge of heaven and he can look down on everything we're saying about him and I think he's probably doing that right now. So I'm so thankful that I'm saved by Jesus Christ for, for all of eternity. But I think if that's our view of salvation, if that's our view of what Jesus has purchased for us, it's good, it's glorious, it's beautiful, but it is short. It is underselling all that is ours. There is a much fuller truth of what it means to be saved by Jesus Christ. You've seen the bumper stickers and the, you know, you've seen the graffiti scrawled on the walls. And in fact, I think we got a picture of a few of them here. You know, every rescue mission in every inner city has the big Jesus saves. You've seen it spray painted. You've seen it held up on billboards, you know, uh, placards, you know, at football games or whatever. When I was in college driving between Virginia and Indiana, uh, it seemed that every highway overpass on Interstate 70, somebody had scrawled it in spray paint, Jesus saves. You've seen that, right? And people who are outside of Christianity will often mock that, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll ridicule it. Like, well, Jesus saves from what? You know, is he like Jesus is saves? Like you got a 401k, your bank account's growing, you know? If Jesus saves my retirement fund, he's not been doing such a good job lately. How about you, right? What is it Jesus saves us from? In fact, there are people who would look at that phrase and they would say, well, that, you know, what are you guys, weaklings? You need, you need a savior? What's wrong with you? Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, get it done, right? But the Bible over and over and over again leverages this word that Jesus Christ has come to be our savior. Do you have Matthew chapter one open? Let's look at it in verse 18. It's a very familiar story. You'll hear it all season long, the month of December. Matthew chapter one, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. I mean, you, you get the story here, right? She's a virgin. They've not been together yet. And Joseph is essentially, in our, in our context, it would be like being engaged. Back then, engagement was a little bit deeper. It was, it was a more of a, a binding legal commitment. But, you know, guys that are young, young folks, you guys think about getting married? You know, if you found your, your partner was pregnant and you hadn't been a part of that, what would you do, right? You'd walk. And, but Joseph didn't want to embarrass her. So being righteous, being good, he just said, I'll, 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 I'll pull away quietly. But the Holy Spirit had something else in mind. Verse 20, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. It's a Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord saves. That's his name, Jesus saves. L the Lord saves, his name's Jesus, you can't. The Lord saves is his name, right? Because he will save his people from their sins. 
This is what he's come to do, to save you and to save me from our sins. Now, what in the world does that mean? when he comes to save us from our sins. I think we have all kinds of ideas and you know, uh, it's not real vogue these days in Christian churches to talk about sin. Uh, people get a little squirrely about that. You know, don't get up in my business. Don't tell me what's right and wrong. Don't point your bony finger at me, preacher. You know, cause by the way, there's three of them pointing back at you, right? And, and, and amen. Uh, chief of sinners right here in the room, promise you, right? And, um, and, and, and so we, we, American culture is nobody wants to be told what to do, right? So we push back on this idea that there is something in us that needs to be saved. And then maybe it even conjures up this image of this angry God, you know, that, you know, if you, if you get past your defensiveness about, you know, don't tell me I'm right or wrong, you know, don't, don't tell me what to do, get past that defensiveness for just a hot minute. And, and you, you know you've sinned, right? A handful of times to the 10th power, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Am I a good company? Uh, Sherry, you and I, I mean, we're, we're total screw-ups, right? So I, I think there's another 100 or so of them here in the room, you know. So then we have this image of an angry God. He was just so torqued off that you are a sinner. Imagine for some of you, there are some very specific things in your journey, in your past, maybe even your present, that you look at with tremendous shame. You wouldn't tell a soul because you're embarrassed yourself, but you also would think that God himself is so, so angry at you. Don't raise your hands on this one, but am I in, am I in the right room? Friends, we need to move past this idea of God being offended and striking at us for our sins. Slow down and catch this, friends. In our culture, especially in America these days, when we disagree with someone, when someone has a different view than us, someone does something different or thinks something different or acts differently than we think is how it should be, we as Americans, we get really offended. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, just raise the word politics and what's, what happens? Instantaneously, your blood pressure goes up. Right? You picture these people you're really offended at. In American culture, we just, now it's, it's when somebody crosses us, somebody wounds us, somebody hurts us, someone offends us, we bristle up and we wanna go back. And sometimes uh, we even strike back at someone. Somebody's hurt you really deeply, they've betrayed you. What do we do? We, we strike back, whether it just be with our words or in some actual manipulative thing that we do, right? This is what Americans do. This is what human beings do. But we need to get past that image that being saved from our sins is that we're getting rescued from God being angry at us and God wanting to strike us down for our brokenness as if God is offended like we get offended. God is not, God is not an abusive parent. When we wrong, do something wrong, he is not offended as if it has been an insult unto him. He is grieved Grieve for us and for the brokenness. Think about this. If you're, if you're a parent in the room and you're a good one, not an abusive parent, and you, let's just you know, make an illustration. You get a little five-year-old boy and, uh, and he pops his nose, uh, pops his sister in her nose, just whack him, right? And you saw it coming and, he was, and you said, little Johnny, don't do that. Do not hit your sister. And he looks right at you and pop, right? You would get angry, correct? But if you're, if you're not an abusive parent, you're not angry at the offense to you. I just told you not to do that, kiddo, and you're doing it anyway. And you would have that sense, I mean, there, there's, you and I would be tempted to make it about ourselves. But really, if you're healthy, what your anger is, is, oh, I don't want this for you. I don't want you to be this kind of person. I don't want the consequences that you're gonna experience by being a person of violence, right? That's a healthy parent. Would, wouldn't, it's not about me when little Johnny's screwing up. It's not, it's not that I'm offended. And friends, we've got to move past this because God is a way better parent than you, I promise. And there's some really good parents here in this room. And God is a much more superior lover of your soul. And so when God, when the scriptures say that God is angry at sin, it's not that he's offended and wants to strike back. 
It's that he cares, he is grieved, and he wants, he is moved to rescue us from the harm. Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sins. The Greek word for savior or, souls or, 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 savior or save is the Greek word sozo. It'll pop up on the screen here. The idea that God is bringing material deliverance from danger or suffering or harm. That's what it means to save someone. Think about if you were like a, a Navy a rescue swimmer, you know, and, and, and an airplane had gone down and you're jumping into the, into the waters. What are you doing? You're, you're jumping in to save the poor guys that are, that are, that are you know, hanging on to life rafts. You know, and the idea, I'm gonna materially deliver you from the harm and the danger that's upon you. The idea that it is material, that it's, a, it's an actual substantive, it isn't just a concept, material, it's for real. It means it is complete and it is thorough. Jesus Christ has come to fully, materially, completely, and thoroughly rescue us, deliver us, us from danger, suffering, and harm. And when you and I sin, when you and I do dumb things, when you and I um, live by our flesh and not by the Holy Spirit, we're creating harm and suffering in our lives and other people. And God's perspective is not this offended, I'm mad at you, I gotta strike back at you. God's perspective is, oh, I need to, I need to pull you out of this. I need to rescue you out of this. Are you with me? From Matthew chapter one, go over to Luke chapter one. So just from Matthew, you're going past the gospel of Mark over to Luke chapter one. In your Red Pew Bibles, page 1013. Terry and Jameson and Christy did a beautiful job as we thought about the concept of hope and they read this very lengthy passage from Luke chapter one. We won't read all of it again, but it was this, the story of how God began to speak to Mary. So we read in Matthew one how God spoke to Joseph about the identity of Jesus. And then in Luke, Luke records Mary's side of the story and how God spoke to her. And, and there's this song that she burst into. It's been called traditionally throughout church history as the Magnificat, which means magnifies. It comes from the very first First phrases of this song. Look at it down in verse 46 as she's just giving praise to God for this narrative of, of her having this Messiah within her. Verse 46, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. Now, uh, in the New International Version, which we're reading, which is on the screen, the word glorifies is actually probably not the best English word. It's many of the older translations would translate it, my soul magnifies the Lord. And that's actually what the Greek word is. It's the idea, you know what a magnifying glass is, right? That, that you, you bring out a magnifying glass, you put it on something and it enlarges it. It's the Greek word for enlarging and making, uh, making an increase upon it. So when she hears, the news of Messiah, she says, oh, oh, my soul increases my view of the Lord. My perspective on, on God is getting bigger because of this. And the Latin word for that phrase is magnificat. That's why it's called, that's her song is called that. She's, ex she's extolling a bigger view of God. And friends, this is what I'm hoping you get this morning. I started by saying, I think we undersell Jesus Christ. I think you and I have a smaller vision of who God is and who Jesus is for our lives. And I hope we'll see it. I hope that Mary, as she, and she hears this narrative of Messiah come to save us from our sins and her vision of God just got bigger. Let's read on. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, friends, be careful here and slow back down. His mercy. Do you know what, you know what the word mercy means? You ever play mercy with your brother, Gordon? Did you ever, like, you know, you get your hands, you, no, you never did that? You never, like, tried to break your, your, your brother's fingers, right? And, and the goal was to get your brother to cry, mercy, mercy, quit, right? Mercy is, is backing off of the judgment that's coming, 
Gordon, you're not the smallest guy in the room. I imagine you could just, just break your, your brother's hands, right? And you backed off that when he cried mercy, right? God backs off. Mercy. His mercy extends to those who what? Who fear him. But be careful, friends. What are you afraid of? You're fearing him not. You're not fearing this idea of God being offended and he's raising his hand to strike at you. That's an abusive parent who raises their hand against their child to strike out of their own offense. God's not an abusive parent. I don't fear his retribution for me because he has none. What this word means to fear God is to have awe and respect, to have a sense that his perspective on my sin, when God says, oh, Chris, don't, no, thou shalt not, right? Don't, don't do that. God is, he is perceiving how desperately wounding this thing will be and he wants to rescue me from it. He's crying out like the rescue swimmer to the drowning victim, no, just, just grab my hand, stop kicking, let me save you. His mercy extends to those who have awe and reverence, a respect that his wisdom, his understanding, his perspective is rich. Let's read on. Verse 51. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. When Mary is saying this, she is living in the Roman Empire. She's living in a very backwoods part of the Roman Empire. She's in the region of Galilee, northern Israel. It's uh, at the time, it was a rather kind of, you know, if I could use this phrase, like kind of like a hillbilly part of, of Israel. It was not, it wasn't the center of commerce. It wasn't the, you know, the, 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 the center of intellect in Israel. It was, it was, it was rolling farmlands and, and mountains and hills. And, and, and so she's a, she's a rather poor girl. She's pledged to be married to a carpenter, which is a very respectable, Respectable career, but a, but a, but a you know a blue collar uh, you know work with his hands a good good man. Uh, she's a part. She lives in a rel- relatively small town, in in the oppression of the Roman government over their society and the taxes that were way out of control. And you say, boy, I felt that one around here. Uh, all the you know the, the, just the tyranny that if you in any way were politically subversive to Rome, they were going to strip you naked and crucify you. All that power, and sh- and she's she's. she's she sees the, the wrongness of society and those in power, and, he, and she says that the Lord has brought them down. But they're not actually gone. All those wicked, evil politicians and rulers, they're still there. So what is she saying? She's recognizing, <laughs> oh God, they, they actually have no real power, they are in fact really shallow and God is lifting up this humble girl and her husband uh, to be from this little town that God is choosing a peasant, a, a farm girl if you will, a, a carpenter and, and these halls of power have nothing, they're vapid, they're empty, they're, there's nothing there, you are raising up from within Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent the rich away empty. I don't know if any of you are Survivor fans, the TV show Survivor, is that still going on or is that, is that, is that still going? Uh, I've stopped watching it. it was, uh, we watched it a lot of years. I was addicted to it. Now I'm not. But you know, when the, when the losing team uh, loses the competition, Jeff Probst stands there and goes, I got nothing for you. Go back to camp, right? You, you guys know that phrase? If you, if you watch the TV show, if you don't, you're like, huh? The rich are still rich. And God says, I, I got nothing for you. Now, hang on. He's not insulting your wealth. There are many people, I'm sure, in this room. I know where we live. We're in Loudoun County, richest county per capita in America. Uh, so there's probably plenty of wealth in this room. And the, and the issue here is not, God is not scorning wealth. What he's scorning are people who are depending upon their wealth. And 
when your pride and your dependence is upon your things or your power, God says, I, I got nothing for you. But the hungry, a person who truly longs for what is right and whole and spiritual, God is filling them with good things. You could be the poorest person in this room. You could be the poorest person on the planet. Unlikely that that's the case of anyone in this room. But you could be the poorest person on the planet. But when your heart is hungry for Jesus Christ, oh, oh, you are full. You are rich. But you sent the, you sent the rich away empty. None of this, friends, is capricious. It is consequential. God is saying, I have nothing for you if your dependence is upon this world. All right, you with me? Got the picture? So what in the world am I supposed to do with this, Chris? Okay, good, good, good theology. Sounds awesome, yay team. Now what do I do? So we had that slide, that material rescue, that, that salvation, to be saved, the Greek word sozo, it is material deliverance from suffering and harm and hardship and that which is dangerous. So what is, what is that material rescue for you, personally, for you, specifically? What is it that needs saved? Do you need it? Do you need rescued from anything? And, and would you like it? Would you like to be rescued? You know, you've heard the story, the parable of the guy that sitting on his roof amongst a flood and, you know, and, and helicopter comes by and, and he's like, oh, no, 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 I don't need rescue and God will, God will save me. And then a boat comes by, oh, no, no, I'm good. God will rescue me. And then, you know, uh, whatever else comes by, oh, I'm good. You know, and the guy drowns and gets to heaven. Hey, why God? And he's like, well, I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a boat. And you, you know, you've heard that parable, right? How about Jesus Christ? Do you need rescued from anything? And by the way, yes. I need rescued like eternally, like so I go to heaven when I die. That's a pretty big one, right? But if that's all you're seeing rescue from, oh, beloved, we are seeing Jesus way too small. Would you magnify the Lord? Would you increase your understanding of what he wants to save you from? Is not just an eternity separated from God. I mean, that's really awesome, right? Amen? But he wants so much more for you. So can we run a couple drills? All right, so pop up on the screen here, four words, all right? Let's see, anger, frustration, sadness, fear. Anybody got any of that going on uh, these days? Oh, Sherry, we're in church. I think they're lying to me. There's at least, at least 50% of the room that ought to be raising their hand right now. Anybody? Oh, okay, thank you, all right, very good, all right. You know, and sadness and fear, by the way, are often the trigger, you know, anger and frustration, often a secondary emotion. I, we saw it last night, you know, Sherry was trying to put up the Christmas tree and have a festive Christmas Eve. He's like, hey, we could get cookies and, and, and cider and play Christmas music, and I'm over at the computer trying to put this PowerPoint together, just losing my mind in frustration. Thank you, Christy Jameson, for the phone call and saving me from that. They rescued me from this PowerPoint. But you know why I was... Preacher Potty Mouth almost came out last night. Almost. 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 Why? Because I was sad. I just buried my best friend yesterday. So, you know, the stupid PowerPoint wasn't working. Lost my head. Friends, and many of you have been through even worse pain. Someone betrays you. It hurts. Or something in your life completely collapses, and I am absolutely terrified. Do you need rescued from this? Now, what happens? See, friends, anger, frustration, sadness, fear, this is not wrong in and of itself. It's normal. You're going to experience these things. Now, what happens for most of us, the next slide, is that we, we turn in our anger, frustration, pain, we turn to self-medication. We turn to outbursts and rage. We, we build up unforgiveness in our heart. We drift towards controlism, trying to manage the circumstance. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right? Yep, you with me? So you could look at this and go, okay, anger, frustration, sadness, fear, that's not sin, but self-medication, outburst, rage, unforgiveness, controlism probably is, right? And so you might think, well, okay, Jesus needs to save me from my sins, like 
I've committed them, now I need him to forgive me. And yes, he does. That is what Jesus dying on the cross was all about. But if it's just, if all we see in our mind is, okay, I have these pressure points in my life, the anger, frustration, and then I sin, and then after I sin, Jesus saves me from it so I don't go to hell as a result of it. If that's all we see, friends, it is so shallow. What Jesus wants to rescue you and me from is before we end up in that sin bucket, he wants to give us something else. Throw the next slide there, the the sozo, the rescue in Jesus. Instead of our anger leading us to medication and outbursts and so forth, he wants it to lead to grace and mercy and trust and forgiveness. This is what he is capable of doing if we'll believe the full power of the gospel, if we'll believe what the scriptures have taught us and what the scriptures offer to us, that when he says in 2 Corinthians 12 that my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. When you and I are in that pressure point and we're frustrated and we're angry and we're hurt and we're and all and and our flesh wants to spring load over to this destructive behavior the rescue of Jesus is he wants to get in there and intercept it before and set us free to something entirely different that's a bigger Jesus than just the guy who saves you from eternity separated from God am i right this is what he wants to do in your life and mine How about another set? Stress and anxiety. Anybody got them? Any of that going on these days, right? I got so much to do, right? Okay, nothing wrong with stress and anxiety. It is normal. Everybody say the word normal. It is normal, right? Now, what does that lead to for us? Okay, our fleshly natural reaction, controlism, we shut down, we withdraw, uh, you know, those kinds of things. We try try to, you know, micromanage everything, oftentimes very clunkily, right? So yes, does Jesus want to forgive us when we get over in in those weeds? And absolutely, he takes away all the eternal consequence of all that's wrong. Absolutely, he saves us in that way. But what's the real salvation he wants to bring to us? The real sozo, the real rescue in Jesus intercept that stress, that anxiety with rest, the ability to pray with thanksgiving, to have faith, like to really put our faith down on God. Philippians says, do not be anxious about anything. And you say, yeah, right. No, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer, with thanksgiving, make your petitions to God. And the peace of God, here's the promise, the peace of God. When, when we trust him, when we put our weight down upon him, when we see that he is more than just forgiving us of our sins, he's more than just rescuing us from eternal consequence. No, he is actually intercepting the stress point in our lives. And when we put our weight down upon that and pray with trust, with thanksgiving, Jesus Christ, thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. When we pray with that kind of thanksgiving, then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, in other words, the peace of God God that is flat out irrational will guard your hearts and minds. My buddy John, who we had a memorial for yesterday, his brother Zach spoke. John passed away in his sleep Thanksgiving morning, you know, middle of the night, leading into Thanksgiving. His brother Zach was in Florida, knew nothing about it. His phone was in a different part of the house. He hadn't checked his phone all morning. And he was getting up and doing his devotions, hadn't looked at his phone yet. And he said that the Holy Spirit really spoke to him about surrendering his heart to God in trust, and he was praying, Lord, whatever happens today, and he had no idea his brother had already passed, whatever happens today, may nothing steal my joy. That's what he was praying. Right? And then he gets done with his devotions, he goes in the kitchen and sees his phone, of course his phone's blowing up from his family, and learns very quickly that his brother had passed, and he stopped right there, he's telling us this at the, at the memorial yesterday, right? He's like, I stopped and I said, Jesus, I believe you, I trust you, and nothing's gonna steal my joy. That doesn't mean this hasn't been a hard week for him, right? But he's putting his weight down, and as I interacted with Zach yesterday, I've known Zach for many years, I interacted with him yesterday, there was a peace about him that was irrational. 
Your brother just died. Ah, he's, but he's got peace and joy in Jesus Christ. Why? Because the peace of God that is irrational, that transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. This is the rescue. This is, I'm drowning in this stress and anxiety, and Jesus is reaching in with rescue. I can help. You with me? You want one, one more? Can we do one more drill? All right. Self-loathing, insufficiency, insecurity, insignificance, loneliness. This haunts a lot of people, does it not? So when we're in that space, what's our reaction, our fleshly reaction? You know, uh, see the next slide there. We go to desperation. We get desperate in our relationships. We may even begin to compromise our moral values, line ourselves up in relationships and circumstances that we know are unhealthy for us, but we're just so desperate, so insecure. Uh, Maybe uh, maybe some of us... uh, you know, uh, cover over that insecurity by being braggadocious and powering up and being strong. Maybe even dishonesty creeps in that we try to paint a picture of someone other than what we are because we're frankly insecure and afraid and so forth. That's the sin nature, right, that we go there. And yes, Jesus has come to save us from our sins. So yes, he will forgive us. Yes, he will uh, eliminate the spiritual consequence of that, but his rescue that he wants to bring to you and me is so much bigger. Friends, magnify the Lord. Increase him in your eyes. He wants to reach into this narrative with a sozo, a rescue from Jesus, that you would begin to believe God about who you are, that you would be able to love and serve other people, that you would become a person of humility and meekness, that you could live in the fullness of how God has created you and your calling. Susan read it earlier uh, during worship, uh, how he has wonderfully, perfectly designed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, he was crafting you, writing a notebook about you. He has he has formed you to be way bigger than you think you are, but you've got to trust in him. You've got to lean into him and follow the calling that he's given to you. You've got to lean into the meekness. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 11, all you who are weary, heavy laden, come to me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am humble and meek and gentle. When you learn to live in that space, these things, these insecurities and these, this sense of insignificance, you no longer have to power up because you're with the Lord of the universe verse. This is how Jesus wants to rescue. So, you want it? Do do you need it? I got an exercise for us to wrap up this morning. So do me a favor. Don't get restless. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'm going to ask Sherry, and she's got some people who are going to help her with some handouts. We're going to give you something. So I know this is risky. We could break the moment. Hang with us, and I'm going to lead you through our so what this morning. What the team is handing to you is a little handout for you to take home. And it's got the three drills we just ran. How God wants to materially rescue you from anger, frustration, sadness, fear. And instead of self-medicating and outburst and rage and unforgiveness, he wants to give you grace, mercy, trust, forgiveness. And there's some Bible verses here that are the very promises of the word of God, the call of the word of God for you. Then there's a mature rescue from stress and anxiety instead of controlism, franticness, shutting down, withdrawal, so forth. He wants to give you rest, petition, thanksgiving, faith, and Bible verses that go with that. And then there's material rescue from self-loathing, insufficiency, insecurity, loneliness. And there is, instead of that, here's Bible verses that he wants to give to you. And you guys that are online, I completely forgot to upload this to the website, so it's not available for you. I'll get it up there later today. You can click on our homepage and pull it down, like probably tonight when I remember to put it up. Apologize for that. All right, you see the slide that's up there. Look at, look at that slide. Which one of these do you need rescued from? My hunch is probably something on here that you need rescued from. Maybe there's something else. Maybe there's a different part of your life and, and you see the model here, how we react to our circumstances with brokenness, and Jesus wants to intersect us. And here, friends, is the promise of God. Here is the word of God for you, the promise 
of how he can deliver you. So here's the so what, and what I want you to do in these next few moments. Know the word. Know the word for you. So right there, just find it, look at it. Soak in that scripture, okay? Know the word for you. And ask Jesus to rescue you. Be the poor soul in the water whose boat has just sunk and you're clinging to a piece of cardboard and you're waving at the rescue helicopter. You want his attention. Jesus, come, rescue me. Pull me out of my reactions and bring me into life. And then surrender. Any rescue swimmer would tell you the drowning guy has got to quit kicking for the rescue swimmer to pull him out, right? Stop kicking, stop trying to control it, stop trying to produce your own outcome and let Jesus Christ grab a hold of your arm, put the rescue uh, net around you or the whatever it is, the little ring, or whatever. let him get a hold of you and bring you out of that into victory. It isn't yours to solve, it's his. So trust him. So these next moments, the song is gonna fit perfect and you'll know why when they start singing it. You do this business with God and you cry out to Jesus Christ for him to rescue you and let him. God, in Jesus' name, right here in this room, uh, across that internet stream for the 20, 25 families that are watching online, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you reach out your arm, grab a hold of us, God. Grab a hold of us and set us free by the promise of your scripture as we yield to you and say, oh, Jesus, come, rescue us, materially rescue us from danger and harm in Jesus' name. Friends, do the business with God. Let's go. Oh, magnify the Lord, friends. Enlarge him in your eyes. Glorify God, magnify him. Father, be so real to us this week in our circumstances. God, let us, let us visualize that hand of rescue coming from the heavenly realms, full of power and glory and strength that is so much bigger than our junk and our stuff and the pressure points. Lord, your word promises that your arm is not too short to save. So God, reach in, reach into our stuff. We invite you in, we invite your arm into our stuff and grab us. And we covenant with you, God, to go along, to surrender, to submit ourselves to you, to trust in your word to trust in your promise. We covenant that, God. And we give you thanks because we know what you're about to do is powerful. Power perfected in our weakness. And so we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And we say, let it be so by saying, amen.